local debut author, Matt Talon. He is a Weymouth resident. Um, and his father, Joseph F. Talon, uh, both are former Army officers and both former high school history teachers with a master's degree in education. They are both products of South Carolina Low Country and both avid fishermen. This journey will, that they're about to take you on will tell the story together of one of their most difficult assignments. Many in the Talon family have known more over the past century, but in crafting this unique story, Matt and Joe had to pull back the scabs, interrogate memories, and dig deep into a set of experiences in 1972 that shaped the remainder of Joe's life. Together, they combed through the memories as well as the artifacts that remained from that tumultuous time. I present to you Matt and Joseph Dunn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. And uh, I want to say thank you to the Thomas Crane Public Library uh, for hosting us this evening. And I uh, want to thank some, we've got some friends here that have made the, uh, the long but not arduous journey across the Four River Bridge uh, from Weymouth to join us here in the uh, city of Presidents. So uh, appreciate everyone coming out uh, this evening. Uh, we want to jump right in with kind of the why. Why did we do this project or why did we uh, see this project through? Uh, after you know such a first of all it was a, a difficult experience for him living uh, this p time period in the war but going back now uh, at this point in his life and our lives together and trying to uh, and trying to make sense of this experience so uh, first I want to let him tell you a little bit about you know, why why he uh, wrote this book or persevered on writing this book I'm supposed to be mic. I guess you can hear. Can you hear me fine? Okay. I don't need that. I just, he's got me mic. Uh, I taught high school history for 21 years, social studies in the Low Country of South Carolina, and I also taught 12 years in military schools at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. And my students, I would share some of the stories that are in this book, but not all of them. A few of them. And they encouraged me and said, Colonel, when you retire, you've got to write this book. You've got to write a book about these stories. They, they just, they couldn't believe them. So I promised them that I would. So I have always tried to make a point of keeping my promises and keeping my word. When I give you my word, I'm going to be somewhere. I'm there or you can find me dead side the road, usually. You know, one or the other. Something drastic has to happen for me to not show up and do what I tell you I'm going to do. So when I told my students and I promised them I would do this, one of the first places we went was back to that little small farm community of St. George, South Carolina, and had a book show there at the local bistro. Not only did my students come, but my original principal showed up. I wasn't even sure he was still alive. <laughs> so he came and bought three books, one for himself and his son and daughter that I had taught, and they have gone on to very successful careers. They were excellent students. And as I talk a little bit about why I, I embarked on this project, I'm showing you here a piece of our family history. Uh, so in this photo are seven brothers. Uh, they were the uh, children of John Talon, who, uh, you know, has Irish immigrant roots, found his way down to South Carolina as a farmer. Uh, they grew up on a farm together. Uh, this, the youngest of the seven brothers there is my grandfather, his father, Harry Talon. So these are the brothers on the farm. Uh, you know, it, this is, you know, early 19, what do we say, in 1930s, early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, and this photo is taken. So still a little optimistic because we have not, they have not actually gotten to the Great Depression yet and the effect that that's going to have on them. Uh, and this is where the farm was in Lee County, South Carolina. Uh, it's an area of South Carolina where it's kind of like a dust bowl. Uh, the land was uh, you know, worn out over time, uh, overuse and over farming. So the land wasn't great where they were trying to make, uh, make a living uh, on that farm. And uh, eventually, and we'll come back to that, but the, uh, the, the Great Depression gets my great grandfather. So he ends up uh, losing that farm to the bank and actually ends up sharecropping on the land that he used to own. So he had a large chunk of land. Uh, he bought out his siblings and consolidated the farm, so he did owe some money. 
And uh, unfortunately, he did that right before uh, depression hit and uh, farm prices plummeted and it got to be a point where he could not keep his own farm. So he finished as a sharecropper uh, on that land. Uh, that prompted my grandfather, Harry Talon, and, and many of his brothers to leave the farm and move to the city of Charleston on the coast because they were looking for better opportunities. You know, things were looking really bad in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, so that's, you know, a picture of my grandfather, his father, 1943. He's working on the docks down in Charleston, and he gets uh, pulled into the uh, effort in the Navy, Naval Armed Guard Service in World War II. So I'm going to read a little excerpt now from the introduction. It, I think will explain more about uh, why I, you know, persevered on this project. You're hearing from me as a 25-year-old Army lieutenant. Uh, so there's some symmetry there because you hear from my father in this book as a 25-year-old Army Lieutenant. In the intro, you hear from an experience from me with my unit. I was stationed in Germany, and we did a couple of day visit to uh, Normandy beaches. And we're you know, visiting the beaches at Normandy. We're staying overnight. We, we call it a staff ride. Uh, thankfully, our battalion commander had uh, taken us up for this really, really turned out to be a really great experience for all of us to go and walk that terrain. I had time. I was 25 years old and Army First Lieutenant. The busload of fellow officers and I rode downhill from the French town of virville sur to the beachfront, then to Dog Green sector of Omaha Beach. We stood in a gaggle near the surf listening to the guide. The sky was overcast but didn't look like rain and the r waves rolling in were small, allowing us to hear our guide easily over the surf. The smell of exposed seaweed and algae-covered rocks hung in the air. The guide led us over the sand to the easy green sector. There an old man with a scraggly gray beard stood, stoop neck next to two younger men, his arm resting on one of their shoulders for support. On his head was a black ball cap with gold braid lettering, World War II veteran, it read. One of our officers chatted him up. He was standing with his two sons on the exact spot on the beach where he came ashore at H hour plus three, or three hours after the invasion began on June 6, 1944. He was a young private first class then and talked with reverence about how his sergeant's ingenuity at keeping him, his team alive while he and his fellow soldiers hopscotched around the dead bodies as they ran back and forth for supplies at the landing craft. Our executive officer asked him what he did during that first hour he was on the beach. I shook, he replied, his eyes wet with tears. Suddenly it felt like we'd barged into a silent cathedral and interrupted this old man and his sons at an altar in prayer. Sensing our intrusion, our battalion commander moved us along. I wished my own grandfather were there with me to retrace his steps on the Normandy beaches. I fought back my own tears, not wanting to appear soft in front of my officer peers. My grandfather Harry was a 20-year-old 20, 20 gunner in the Navy when he approached the shores at Normandy. I knew he had been there, but I knew nothing about his experience. What did this beach look like to him? Did he shake as well when he saw it? Did he get to the beach, or did he stay on one of the naval ships offshore? Our group made its way up the slight incline of the beach in the same direction that the assaulting Allied forces moved on D-Day. We reached the long parallel pile of smooth rocks called the Shingle, what remained of the only defilade that would have separated troops from the relentless German machine gun fire. Many of us laid prone on our bellies alongside it to get a better sense of the perspective our fighting forebears would have had six decades earlier. I thought about the German bolt-action Mauser rifle that my grandfather brought back from Normandy and wondered how he came to have it. Our guide led us up a winding trail through Le Moulin Draw to the top of a large ridge line over land that would have been littered with buried mines and barbed wire. Americans assaulting the ridgeline on June 6, 1944, would have found enemy bunkers and trench lines to engage at the top. When we came over the rise, we found instead a large, beautifully manicured, lush green lawn containing the most striking military cemetery I'd ever seen. Our unit leadership brought with us a, a large floral wreath with a banner across it, emblazoned with our 28th Transportation Battalion name and colors. We laid it at the prominent central monument that housed bells that rang at that moment, playing the Star Spangled Banner. We stood silently at attention. A group of French armor officers in uniform passed by, passing by stopped and saluted. 
The anthem was followed by taps as we looked out across a field of thousands of white crosses and occasional stars of David. Again, I wish my grandfather were there with me. After the wreath laying ceremony, we were on our own to explore the cemetery. I stopped at Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s grave, one among the many. As I walked, I let my fingertips graze the tops of the stone markers, aware that buried under each marker was a man, likely close to my age when he had been killed. I made my way to the edge of a high bluff overlooking the beach. In the distance, along the edge of the rolling channel surf, I spotted two horses and riders crossing the easy red sector of Omaha Beach. The riders seem unhurried and let their horses playfully splash in the edge of the surf. I envision how different the scene would have been there on Omaha Beach 60 years earlier. I stood near where Germans would have rained, down, rained fire down on the attacking force. My grandfather had been there, had survived this brutal assault, but I knew nothing of his experience. Right then, I resolved to find out, to talk to my grandfather and document his D-Day memories. I had time. So we come back to that theme over and over that I had time, uh, but, and this is uh, my grandfather and me. This photo is from 2000 and uh, I believe 2008 or seven, seven, eight, somewhere in there. But we were having a, I think it was early 2007, to be honest. Uh, but we're very close to the end of his life in this picture. We didn't realize it, but we were celebrating a, a wedding anniversary, his 65th wedding anniversary. And um, I go on to talk about it in the introduction about how life gets in the way and I'm moving an army and teaching job and moving around and eventually um, you know he passes away when I'm in a moving truck coming up here to uh, move to Boston in the summer of 2008 so uh, I did not ha take the time you know before he passed to really go deep with him on his experience uh, during World War II and so that's obviously a regret of mine this is a picture of me as a child working with my father, you know, in the early 80s, uh, you know, working in a, this is an area where he keeps a garden patch. He's a big gardener. Uh, to this day, he's kept a garden in this area. But you can see as a kid, we're working together. And, uh, you know, this kind of what, what this project turned out to be, chopping wood together, you know, <laughs> moving logs. You know, it uh, uh, became a labor of love and working together on, on this project. But he came to me in uh, 2000 and nine in the fall with these this is one of the pages right here a handwritten uh yellow legal pad sheets with his memories uh from vietnam and so that you know what triggered for me was that thought of you know i wish i had spent the time to really document uh my grandfather's experience in world war ii he was in both the not only was he at d-day but he was in the pacific theater as well on ships so we didn't want to let this opportunity pass and that's really like what started us on this odyssey that became uh, 100 Days in Vietnam, a memoir of love, you know, war and survival. Um, what we're going to do now is give you a little flavor of different sections of the book, like how we put this together, because we think this is unique. Uh, this, this memoir is different than what you'll see in uh, the Vietnam literature. We've read a lot of the Vietnam War memoir literature out there right now. This is not a year in the jungle in the 60s. You know, he's there at the very bitter end in 1962. He's an army pilot. There's stuff going on on base and stuff going on in missions. So it's a very different memoir than what... 72. You Se oh, off. excuse me. Did I say 62? Yeah. Uh, I meant to say 1972 at the very bitter end of the war. Um, but we get you very quickly into Vietnam. And how we do that is an opening chapter uh, that we call Goodbye. Uh, and I, one of the things from that, I won't read an excerpt from that chapter, but I think one of the very interesting things, and I think this speaks well to the yin and the yang of his personality and, and the family, but there's a group of family members gathered at the Charleston Municipal Airport. And at that day, your family could actually walk out to the tarmac behind a little fence and say goodbye to you. And so there was a gaggle of family, almost 20, 25 strong, and they're all saying their goodbyes before he gets on the plane. And, and this is May of 1972. And he's handed two items. Uh, and one is this uh, Bible, this New Testament, uh, that his uh, cousin gives him, and it's ins inscription inside. Uh, and, you know, he keeps this Bible with him during missions and, and throughout the deployment. 
And then his father slips him uh, brass knuckles in case the fighting gets in close. So I love the fact that like the two things he, were, he was given was a Bible and, and brass knuckles on his way out. So that was, you know, you get that scene in the goodbye chapter. Then we have a, a very short, these are very short, punchy chapters, standby. And in standby, you get the sense of uh, what, where is this guy going? Like, is he actually going to end up in Vietnam? Because in 1972, there was a lot of talk about the war being over and guys are being pulled out left and right. So he's still not sure, even flying to San Francisco and being at Travis Air Base, am I actually going to go to Vietnam or am I going to be diverted to somewhere else? Uh, and it you know, could have been Alaska, it could have been somewhere else to fly these surveillance missions. Uh, so you get a little bit of that doubt. So there's a, there's a final paragraph in, uh, in that chapter, in that goodbye, or that standby chapter, and it goes like this. On the evening of my second full day waiting at Travis Air Force Base, my name appeared on the manifest. At dawn, the plane lifted off the runway and climbed steadily over San Francisco. I could see streetlights turning off as the city awoke to a new day. In the east, the sun rose directly at our backs while we flew in the opposite direction over the dark skies of the Pacific heading toward Vietnam. So it's just a short close to that chapter, but I think it's very telling that as he's leaving, uh, it's the dawn of a new day in San Francisco, sun's rising in the east, but he's flying towards darkness in Vietnam and kind of the unknown of what's to come. Uh, there's also a punchy short chapter called Le Leaving for Saigon. Uh, and again, this, you know, this is him on the airplane uh, trying to uh, deal with this long, long ride over uh, 25 plus hours, stopping in Hawaii, stopping in Guam. Uh, you know, the, the guys are smoking their last cigarette, chain smoking on the aircraft. He's not a smoker. So he, he's not loving the fact that they're stuck on this airplane and guys are, are drinking and smoking as much as they can on this uh, long, long uh, ride over to Vietnam. Well, at the close of that uh, chapter, leaving for Saigon, uh, there's a scene here where he says, uh, on, as a non-drinker and a non-smoker, I found the brief stops on Hawaiian Guam did little to relieve my nose and lungs. By the end of the 25-hour trip, I could hardly wait to get off that plane to breathe fresh air. Approaching the airfield at Tonsonut Air Force Base outside Saigon at 2100 hours, I could see illumination rounds dropping in the night sky. The attached mini parachutes slowed their descent for 30 to 45 seconds, enough to light up the base's security perimeter as they burned off. I felt the landing gear drop into position. A jolt of adrenaline coursed through me in anticipation of getting off that flight and into the night air. The drag slowed the plane as it aligned itself, reduced thrust, and touched down on the runway. The passenger door opened. Rather than a burst of fresh air, however, the smell that hit me was like a dumpster behind a Chinese restaurant. The stench of rotting food and oppressive humidity enveloped me. I heard the rumbling of artillery and the distinctive thump, thump, thump of mortar fire. I had arrived. I was in Vietnam. So that was his uh, kind of arrival scene, just to give you a little flavor of what he's coming into and coming in as a new guy. And then, you know, the heart of the book, the real heart of this story is told in this large chunk chapter that we call In Country. But In Country really becomes a, uh, it's a that's where you get that 100 days log. It's told in a journalistic feel. So you're not hearing from him as a 74-year-old reflecting back. You're hearing it in the voice of a 25-year-old as he's there and as it unfolds. And the way we're able to do that is because uh, we, we uncover and unearth through this process all of these primary source materials. So we have um, letters, as you see an example of one on the left, letters that he wrote to his new wife, my mother, married in J July of 71. Now he's off to Vietnam in May of 72. Yeah, she's here tonight. You may have met her. That, uh, the uh, celebrated their 50th anniversary at the release of this book. But very much in this book is that love story because we're able to save and excerpt some of those letters. We don't put them all in there, but we, we, we're selective about what we place in there. But the letters give us a real sense of his voice at, in the moment and, and some of the experiences he's having. So we're able to put together a chronology 
of knowing when certain types of missions happen, certain things happen around base. There's also some cassettes that we're able to recover. They, uh, you know, the, the way to do Skype or FaceTime in 1972 was record yourself talking on a cassette tape for an hour, drop it in the mail, send it off, listen to it, uh, record over it and send it back. Uh, so that's, uh, there was a lot of cassette tape exchanges. Unfortunately, they didn't want to spend the money for a new cassette every time. <laughs> so uh, there's only two or three cassettes that they would use and record over them over and over. So uh, had they had more money, uh, you know, that maybe we could have had a catalog of cassette tapes to go with the catalog of letters. But we had some and that was invaluable. Uh, and then we also had uh, a unit yearbook, like you see here from the unit he was in. Uh, the 131st Military Intelligence Company, that unit, that unit yearbook's a trove of information. Uh, it was actually one of his extra duties as a new lieutenant to work on the yearbook. And then we uh, dug through the current events of the day, and you see here the Charleston Evening Post. And that's one of the newspapers we went to. Uh, there were two daily papers in the city of Charleston at the time. Uh, the News and Courier, which came out in the morning, and the Evening Post which came out in the evenings. They obviously have merged to be the Post and Courier now because uh, cities can barely support one newspaper, let alone a morning and an evening daily. But what was beautiful about these papers is they ran UPI and AP stories of the day. So you got a lot of uh, information of what was happening in Vietnam on the AP and UPI wire that would run in the local paper. So again, another secondary source, but very helpful for us in putting this story together. And if you, those of you who are in here, and I think most of you, um, except Tracy Gately, uh, lived through 1972. She's too young for that. But every, everyone else who's in here, I think it may have experienced 1972. And you may remember that was when he was there from May until August, there was the election of 72, McGovern versus Nixon. Uh, Nixon was trying to uh, balance ending the war, which he had promised to do in 1968, but not ending it too quickly because he didn't want to uh, have Saigon or the South Vietnamese government fall before Election Day. So he's uh, dancing this little tightrope uh, politically that year uh, in, in kind of protracting the, the, uh, the war. Uh, Nixon and Brezhnev are meeting. Uh, you may remember the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties uh, that were signed. So there was a real brokering of a, a, you know, a detente with the Russians at that time. There was an infamous visit by Jane Fonda uh, in July of 72 that uh, many veterans you know, talk about to this day. Uh, it has lived on uh, long past her visit there. There was the uh, Boris Spatsky, Bobby Fischer chess matches happening, uh, if you remember that. Um, and, and that actually filtered down to the the, their motor pool and they would, uh, my father and his motor sergeant would play chess with one another and call it, take turns being Boris or being Bobby uh, in those chess matches. And then uh, there was also the Watergate break-in. And this is the, we include this clipping and some, we have some, this is a news clipping that's in the book, but we have some uh, strategic news clippings in this um, tapestry that we call it, where we're pulling together some different threads for you. Uh, this happened there in June of 72, and this was kind of the initial story that came out the next day. As you all know, this story uh, had a lot more to it uh, than, than what was initially reported, and, and this would uh, take on a new life uh, long after the war. Um, so at, at this time, you know, I thought we would give you a little flavor of this. When we talk about a tapestry of weaving together these elements, thought we would give you an idea or a taste of some of these elements uh, briefly. And uh, right now, he's going to read for you one of the letters that he wrote home, uh, a short one, but I think it's representative of some of the what's going on there. Yeah, this letter uh, that I wrote my wife, who's sitting right out there, uh, handwritten letter, you know, back in the day we did that kind of thing, put pen and on paper and actually had real letters, you know, you had to put an envelope. Of course, in Vietnam, you didn't have to put a stamp on it, you had to do it right free in the corner. So you got free postage, but this was Friday, the 26th of May, 1972. For those of you who can remember what you were doing that day, you got a better memory than I do. So, if it wasn't for the letters, I would be wondering myself. This is to Dear Martha Ann, I sometimes wonder why the Army spent all that money they did training me to fly and collect intelligence. Here I am in an aviation unit doing very little flying 
and working my wits out in the motor pool for which I know nothing about. I feel wasted and frustrated like I've never felt before in my life. I want to do a good job, but I don't even know how to start. I had one man, I had one man who was sent to our company from another unit. He is constantly going AWOL. I talked to him this morning and explained how serious this offense could be in a combat zone, but it had very little effect on him. He worked until lunch, and then he went AWOL again. He made it to lunch. I'm sure in a few weeks things will look better because right now they could hardly look worse. I thought I would be here to fly, but it looks like I'll be spending only about 30 to 40 hours a month flying and the rest of my time will be spent on additional duties. I wish, I, could, I wish you could be here or I could be there. I just want us to be together again. I love you so very much. Love always, your lover, Joe. We also, uh, we, we include some transcribed audio and we're not gonna read any of that now because there's multiple characters sometimes that come out, but we, just a couple of snippets of transcribed audio but what it does is it takes you into, uh, for instance, a dinner table. Uh, my mother took the cassette recorder to Sunday dinner and recorded everyone, the family around the table having dinner. And the, and the family dinner was an important part of our family and remains so in the past 50 years. And it's been a real treasure to go back and hear those folks talking uh, in the witty banter around the table and the fish and the fishing trip that led to the fish that they were eating at, uh, at dinner time. So. Uh, an another thing that was really uh, uh, not only unique when we went back to look at it, but then when we included it in, I think it gives you a real flavor for uh, not only our family, but kind of Southern culture and, and the history of, of that time. Um, the, the other thing that we're able to do by, uh, by telling this as a 25 year old in real time, so you're sitting there, as you're reading this, you're going through the deployment with him. So what that means is we can't we can't talk about the future past 1972, but what we can do is we can talk about from age zero to 25. So there are things that happen in Vietnam that remind him of something from childhood or it brings up a memory or it cues something in. Something he's doing there ties back to something from, from before Vietnam. And so there's a couple of instances where we're able to strategically do this. And one of those is around an event um, one night uh, on base He's trying to get some downtime because, you know, you get this a little bit in the letter, but as a new lieutenant in this pilot unit, he was forced to run the motor pool with the wheeled vehicles, with the misfit soldiers that nobody wanted because those soldiers weren't trusted to work on the airplanes. They put them in the motor pool to work on the wheeled vehicles, which pilots didn't care about. They trashed the wheeled vehicles. So he's the new guy, the new lieutenant, and they forced him to take on this job with the soldiers who, as you heard, are AWOL, they're on drugs a lot. They don't want to be there. Uh, remember, this is a, a big drafty force and it's at the bitter end of this war. So really bad time to be there. Uh, but he's trying to get some downtime. He's at the officer's club one night and his motor sergeant comes and finds him and, uh, with a frantic message that they got to go get their guys who had gone on a trip uh, into Da Nang uh, to one of the other bases and have been stopped by the MPs and held at another installation for hitting a local Vietnamese man. We don't have much of the details, but as they're leaving the base, they go and grab weapons and they're gonna go check on their guys. Uh, they, they're in a Jeep that they forgot to uh, bolt in the passenger seat from working on it that day. So the sar motor sergeant's driving rapidly out of the airfield, turns sharply, he goes flying out of the side of the Jeep, gra grabs it on the way out, he's you know, banging his knee, scuffing up, he's bloody and scratched up. So, but they, they press on to go check on their men. But what this scene does is it allows him on the drive to go check on the men to reflect back on some childhood stories. So I'm gonna let him tell you about the first time. That wasn't the first time he had a car accident or getting run, the first time he was run over by a car. Yeah, for some reason, you know, I seem to be, uh, have a bullseye on my back. But when I was five years old, my father that you saw pictures of earlier, he was a salesman for standard brands that delivered coffee and yeast and flour and everything to restaurants in the Charleston area. That's the company he was working for. And he drove a step van. If you're familiar with a step van, you know, you step up in it, you step out of it, and then it's got double doors in the back. 
sliding doors in the front and only one seat usually, the driver's seat. Uh, people on the other side, you just stand in the wheel well and hang on. And uh, I would wait at our driveway. We lived in what they termed were servants' quarters uh, in Charleston because that was a little bit more uh, rentable than telling you you were living in slave quarters, but you were. What had been slave quarters at one time behind the big house, we were in the small houses out back, and that's where we lived. And uh, I would wait on my father to come home, so I hop in the truck because to me it was like going to Disney World. You know, it was a big thrill to get to ride in the truck with my dad. And he was driving around back in the backyard, and he normally stopped where there were cinders in the road that I had put out there from the chimney. Burning, we burned coal back then for heat, and uh, there were cinders in the road from burning coal, and I had put a lot of them out there myself. And I just knew he was going to stop before he got on Mr. Sherma, who owned the big house, uh, his grass, because he'd fussed if my father parked on his grass. I didn't know he was planning on washing his truck that night. So he kept driving. I jump out and fall because of the momentum of the truck. And he runs over both my legs with the dual rear tires. <coughs> Fortunately, I was in deep uh, Charleston grass, which the proper name is St. Augustine, wide blade, deep grass. And it obviously probably didn't break my legs, but it may have fractured a few of them, bones but they put me in an old army cot in the kitchen so I didn't have to go upstairs to my bedroom uh, that I shared with my sister. And uh, I stayed in that cot and Dr. Chagru made a house call. That's back when doctors actually came to your house. And he came and checked on me and he talked with a heavy Charleston accent and he said, mum, he always referred to my mother as mum, mum, this boy needs nothing but some grits and some red-eyed gravy, and he'll be just fine. You keep him in this warm bed for the next three days, and he'll be fine. So that was my treatment from Dr. Chagru. No x-rays, uh, no, no checking reflexes or stuff like that. He just took one good look at me and looked at my legs and all that. And he didn't see any swelling, I guess, or whatever. I don't know what he's looking for, but that was his diagnosis, so uh, that was the case. And uh, I recovered from it, but even years after that, I would get these phantom pains in my legs. So I'm sure there must have been some hairline fracture somewhere in my legs from being run over by those dual tires. Well, let's, let's hear about maybe the second time you were run over. <laughs> For some reason, the Studebaker company is the only automobile company to survive transition from wagons to automobiles. And for some reason, the Studebakers liked to hit me and come after me. Because when I was at the same age of five, we were at Folly Beach with our dog, and the dog was like three or four feet in front of us coming from the beach to my uncle's house. A black and tan Studebaker came by and wiped out Mitzi. Just killed her right in front of us. And I, it, it was upset me and upset my sister. We buried Mitzi in the back of my uncle's beach house in his yard uh, out there. We always go by to visit Mitzi's grave, and I still drive by that house and remember that day when we buried Mitzi out there and lost our little dog. Well, several years later, I'm going to school in the second grade, and it happens to be uh, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And that was a day to remember. And it was the anniversary and it was freezing cold. Back then we had cold weather. We haven't been having cold weather like that lately, but there was ice everywhere. And my mother had me bundled up and uh, I was wearing one of those hats that had the earmuffs that come down and a chin strap that locks underneath there. And I had on mittens and gloves and I was wrapped up in a heavy coat that belonged to my cousins that was two sizes too big for me, but it was the warmest coat we had in the house and she put that on me. And on my feet, I had on corduroy pants, because they were the thickest pants I had. And I had on boots. Now these weren't just any boots. These were paratrooper boots from World War II. One of my friends uh, in downtown Charleston, the Shermas, had passed those boots down to me when their boys outgrew them. Because you didn't throw stuff away back then. 
You know, if it still could work, you'd give it to somebody who could use it. The same way with that used coat. So there I was with those boots on, busting ice puddles. I got over to Ronald Parnell's house and we were walking to school and my father stopped and picked us up and gave us a ride to the corner. So we got back across the street again, got in his car, and it was a two-door car, so we had to crawl in the back. We get to the end of the street, we get out, and Ronald says, last one across the street to Rotten Egg. I took off running, around the corner. Here comes a Studebaker, a bullet nose, 1949-50 Studebaker, painted battleship gray, wiped me out. I'm laid out on the concrete, on the asphalt, looking up at a Studebaker like this, <laughs> with my leg twisted backwards and up underneath the Studebaker, and on top of me was the wheel. And the woman got out and looked and says, oh, I'm stopped on top of you. She gets back in, cranks it up, puts it in gear, and backs it off of me. Yeah. So <laughs> there I was, hit and run over again by Studebaker trying to get to school in the second grade. And they did after that because my classmate was killed a year before, Wally Atkins, at the same intersection. He was killed trying to get across that street, so they finally put a traffic light there that we could stop the traffic and kids could cross because we had to walk to school. You know, we weren't close enough to school to get on a bus, so you had to walk. So that was the story of Studebaker's out to get you. <laughs> So we use, uh, there's strategic opportunities throughout that, that tapestry of 100 days to reflect back on these childhood memories. And another, another thing uh, that he would tell you and other folks of you who may have experienced combat yourself, uh, there's oftentimes monotony and boredom, and then moments of sheer absolute terror. So, uh, you know, there are some of those stories throughout the 100 days where the, the monotony of daily life and what they're doing from day to day turns into moments of terror. And um, I'll, I'll share for you a, a little excerpt of that um, because remember, he was doing two things at once. He was flying most of his OV-1 Mohawk missions, which was a surveillance plane at night over North Vietnam, a mission that would probably be done by either satellite imagery or a drone today. But back then, they would fly and take imagery of different points in North Vietnam. So that was his, mainly his night job. His day job, remember, was a bunch of extra duties around the compound, but primarily that motor officer, get our, our wheeled vehicles uh, you know, working again, operational. So doing so, they would take these wheeled vehicles to different places in Da Nang to either turn them in or have them get repaired or get parts. So these parts runs could be very routine, or they could be like this particular day, uh, July 22nd, 1972. Our simple mission today was to pick up parts at the Da Nang Air Base. Mop borrowed another soldier's hat this morning, and I made sure not to wear my black one. The July heat and humidity has not let up. None of our vehicles has air conditioning, and the air circulating in through the windows was so hot and sticky that it felt like we were driving into a blow dryer. Still, at least it was airflow. But making the parts run to the airport across the river, rather than the depot, meant we had the opportunity to eat at our favorite shrimp restaurant. Of course, last time we were there, it got blown up. But they were rumored to be back in business the next day. As usual, we crossed the Han River via the i Corps Bridge, and we wound our way through the streets of Da Nang. Nearing the portion of our route that intersects with the corner of Blood Square, we noticed numerous locals running towards it. Black smoke billowed up over the row of houses separating our three-quarter ton truck from the main square. It was 10 in the morning, the time of day when many women and children shopped in the downtown open-air markets. As we crept along the road leading through the square, we saw the burning hulk of a passenger bus still smoldering. People were crying and dazed, most of them women and children. Some partially burned civilians walked around aimlessly, looking in all directions as, as if they had misplaced something. The smoke poured from the bus in a terrific black column. The foggy haze in the air carried a noxious smell I recognized, charred rubber. But with it was another smell fouler than anything I've ever experienced. It was the smell of burning flesh and human guts. I felt queasy, and for a moment I thought I might vomit. I tamped down hard on the sensation and harder on my instinct to command Mop to stop the truck so we could help. 
Mop looked at me, a wordless exchange that communicated volumes. The standing command, one I have repeated countless times, was never to stop and engage the local population for any reason. We watch the children cry and the locals call for help in Vietnamese. Mop and I navigate our vehicle through the humanity gathered at Blood Square and continued on our parts run. So that just gives you a little uh, scene of how like a routine parts run can turn, you know, brutally violent and, uh, you know, and this is a scene that uh, in a smell and an experience, sensual, a sensory experience that has haunted him uh, one of those memories that haunts him, you know, 50 years later. Uh, the, the guy on that trip was a, a mop uh, because of his floppy hair, uh, but it was a, mop was one of the most trusted guys in the motor pool misfits. So that's mop right there uh, from the unit yearbook uh, standing next to his wrecker. Um, wanted to give you, oh, did you see mop? The, uh, yeah, that's mop. Wanted to give you a sense now that th that was a flavor of some aspects of the major heart of the book, but there's another part too about the recovery. So we take you back in 1972, we take you back to the States and his first stop after nine days at the famous China Beach Hospital. And uh, you know, we won't ruin for you all the drama of why he's injured, but suffice to say, he's, he is um, medevaced out um, of China Beach Hospital and ends up at the uh, Brook Army Medical Center uh, and is getting treatment for a number of months in the fall of 1972 there uh, and that's you know Fort Sam Houston San Antonio Texas uh, he's going to uh, read an excerpt now for you of um, you know he he was given morphine a lot to deal with uh, the pain of the treatments and the pain of the burns and so he's going to read an excerpt of where he uh, realizes how dependent upon morphine he's become in talk, talking with his nurse. Morphine is a drug of choice in the burn unit. With severe burns, the itching is so intense and the urge to scratch feverishly is almost impossible to withstand. I watched a young civilian boy in the ward the other day scratch off his new skin grafts repeatedly. Even after the hospital staff put his arms in bed restraints, the boy's mother stealthily released him from the restraints during the evening visitation, which allowed him to commence scratching and destroyed his grass all over again. Pain is ever present. I'm given morphine injections every two to four hours to manage it. At first, I got some relief. It did not take long until I was again begging for another shot, even before a full three hours had passed. The shots have become less effective over time as I've developed a tolerance for morphine's effects. Sometimes the nurses come back quickly with the morphine syringe and sometimes there's a long delay after my request. One of my nurses looks a lot like my great Anna, my great Aunt Anna, who herself was a nurse. She died years ago, but I remember her well. I call this nurse Aunt Anna and in return she calls me nephew. Today, after administering a morphine injection to me, she looked at me and said, Nephew, I think you're getting too many of these shots. I said, Do you think I'm becoming an addict? She said, You already are one. Well, take my chart and write on it not to give me any more morphine for pain. She said, Are you sure you want to do that, nephew? I said, I don't want anything habit forming for pain from this moment on. No matter how much I cry or beg for it, please don't let them change that order. I'm already feeling the effects of my decision. The crawlers have invaded my bed and my body like thousands of imaginary bugs infesting the burn areas of my skin. They seem to be eating my skin and my flesh. They are so much worse at night. You know, during the uh, recovery period, and that's just a glimpse into hospital life, but we take it out into the late 70s. So uh, unlike the 1972 deployment section where you get a day by day almost, uh, you know, journalistic style, you get scenes from the 70s. So it starts to spread out a little bit when you talk about how we structure this. 
and you get different scenes from the 70s and from his life. And for, for those of you who have either been on a deployment or had an injury or had something that you had to recover from for a period of time, there are different things, I think, that you draw on to recover in mind, body, and spirit. And he had close friendships. There was a close friendship that he had um, in North Carolina coming out of this. There was uh, this dog, Coco, that you see on the screen, uh, became a big part of his recovery. Growing up in the, the culture of hunting and fishing in South Carolina, uh, quail hunting was a big part of his life. And he wanted to get back to that as soon as he could get back to walking through the forest. And Coco helped him do that, and it helped him get his, his walking. Uh, he was supposed to get his steps in and try to get his mobility back in his legs. And, you know, doing, doing quail hunting in the woods with Coco was a great way to do that. And this is him, actually, with that German short hair pointer, uh, Coco, in the 70s together. The sad thing is, and a big setback for him was losing a friend to cancer who was helping him in his own recovery. He lost that friend. Uh, unfortunately, and he lost Coco during this time period. So uh, there's setbacks to the recovery because some of those people helping you through recovery are suffering themselves. Uh, and, and we think that this, this section resonates. It can resonate with any, any time period or any really human experience in, in, who are trying to recover from, from serious injury. Um, and this, this is uh, kind of the uh, one of the final scenes with Coco, and I'll try to get through it without being emotional. I would not ask him to read this. Um, it's very difficult. I don't difficult. think I can do it. I couldn't yeah. write it. I, the pages were wet with tears when I got through writing it. It's been six weeks since the heartworm treatment, and I feel like I've made a terrible mistake. Coco is a shell of his former self. He has never recovered fully from the treatments. We are not hunting at all. The vet told me the treatments killed the heartworms. But those dead worms had to work their way out of the heart, and many of them found their way into his lungs. He got to the point where he couldn't walk across the backyard without foaming at the mouth like he had rabies. His breathing became labored. He didn't eat properly, so the pa for the past couple of weeks, I've been holding him in my lap and feeding him Denty, Moore, Denty Moore's beef stew from the palm of my hand. It is one of his favorite meals, and I hoped it would help him get stronger and better. Earlier this week, he totally refused to eat and wouldn't even lift his head. I took him to the vet again, and he suggested that we put him down because there's nothing more he could do for him. We don't know his exact age, but the vet estimates him to be 9 or 10 years old. Then the vet told me he didn't expect Coco to survive the heartworm treatments at his age, which really made me upset. Why didn't he tell me that before we did the treatment? At least I had a dog and not a ghost when I took him in there the first time. Yesterday, I took him out to the farm near, the ho near our house where we have hunted together so many times. My intent was to shoot him. I carried him out across the field and laid him down by the base of a big cherry tree. I then raised the barrel of my 22 caliber rifle and drew a bead on him, only to pull right at the last second and shoot the tree beside him. I'm an expert shot, but I missed badly. Tears streamed down my face and I was shaking. With the methodical precision and slow pace of a military funeral gun salute, I fired six rounds over a period of a few minutes. It is a single-shot rifle, so I had to take the time after each shot to reload my rifle. None of my shots hit Coco. I just couldn't do it. So instead, I left him there tied to the tree while I ran home to get him his water bowl and some more food. When I returned about a half hour later, Coco was dead. Slumped in a heap at the base of that cherry tree, he died alone without me. It felt like a part of me died too. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. There were other aspects of the recovery period that I think will resonate with you if you're a fan of Forrest Gump, whether you've read the book or seen the movie. Uh, he has a bit of a real life Forrest Gump to him. Uh, this is a, a scene, there's a funny scene and interaction with the First Lady at the White House when he was in. Uh, getting treatment at Walter Reed Hospital. Uh, the first lady had just gotten out of her cancer treatments. She had breast cancer treatments and she had come back to the hospital wanting to meet with wounded Vietnam veterans. So he got put on a bus with a bunch of other veterans, Vietnam veterans who were being treated at Walter Reed, taken over to the White House uh, and, and meet the first lady. And so there's an interesting story and interaction that I'll let you read about there. Uh, but there's also uh, a story of him and his cousin Larry Bubba Cobb. So he and his uh, cousin Bubba 
started a shrimp boat and a shrimp business in, in 1979 because they thought they could get rich quick down in Charleston uh, on, you know, catching boatloads of shrimp. And uh, so there's a couple of funny stories about uh, how, how wrong they were, that they were gonna, they were gonna make a killing, uh, you know, shrimping in the late 70s, early 80s. First day we caught 14 shrimp, brought them back live in a five gallon bucket. <laughs> that's he his, said have enough for a cocktail and that was it. <laughs> and that's his cousin Larry Bubba Cobb working the back deck, uh, you know, later on, that picture was taken in the 90s. But uh, Larry actually still has that shrimp boat and uh, even though he's, you know, in his 70s now, he does take it out on occasion. And that, that boat, uh, the Bridget, is still uh, tied up on the Shim Creek, the famous dock in Charleston, where a lot of the shrimpers used to tie up. So uh, that, that boat and that kind of Forrest Gump story lives on to this day. And then there's a final... He, oh, go ahead. He led the uh, fleet for the blessing of the fleet in April this year. They always had that beginning of the season. He was the first boat because his boat was the oldest boat with the oldest captain. And the very next week he had it at the boat yard to get a bottom job and had tied it up and left it. They were supposed to lift it. They didn't do it and during the night the boat sank. So I had to fork over a little bit of money and try to help him get it back off the bottom, which we did. And he's got it back up operational, but he's had to do a lot of work. He's not shrimping it because he's got still some of the decks got to be replaced after the damage that was done when the boat sank. So it has not shrimp this year yet, but he still hopes that he'll get it back out there with the fleet next year, maybe. And then there's a final section to this book. Uh, we call it the quest. So you have the, you have the deployment, you have the recovery, and now you have the quest. And in the quest, it's a, uh, it's written in my voice. So you hear my voice in the introduction, you hear my voice in the quest. In between, uh, you hear his voice as a 25-year-old and then in, in his late 20s and early 30s in the 1970s. But the quest was, uh, you know, in the 2008 to 2013 time frame. Uh, and that was uh, trying to get Purple Heart recognition for him and a man with him. And again, we won't, you know, spoil the book for you let you read some of that uh, section for yourself. Uh, the man we're talking about is, um, you know, a specialist fifth class, so spec five, Daniel Richards. Uh, and you can see a Purple Heart here. Uh, and I'm gonna read a little uh, segment of the quest uh, in my voice that kind of gives you a summary and, and we'll, we'll start, we'll turn it over to questions after that and let you ask any questions that you have. Uh, but to give you a little sense of me trying to make sense of, of his experience uh, and how it impacted and changed him and how it impacted and changed our family uh, and you know making sense of this quest for the Purple Heart which was almost 40 years after um, 1972. Growing up I didn't know what caused the injuries to his body or the scars on his arms and legs but even as a very young kid I knew something really bad must have happened to my dad. I saw it each time he got out of the shower and methodically applied Vaseline intensive care lotion to the grafted areas of scarred skin left mottled and hairless. I saw it on the calm non-reaction he once had when he leaned a weed eater against the gutter of our house and the string whipped ferociously against the grafted skin on his shin, leaving multiple red welts in the numb, nerveless skin. I saw it when he occasionally pulled up from a task straightened his lower back and quietly winced in pain. We spent a lot of time together working in the yard, and long before I was ever allowed to push the real lawnmower myself, I had my own Fisher-Price corn popper toy mower, which I pushed around the lawn a few steps behind my dad as he cut the grass. I loved the smell then and still love the smell today of a freshly cut lawn. As much as the yard work was simply required of me, whether it was picking up pine cones or magnolia blossoms or weeds, I think I also wanted to please my dad and do the task well. When I wasn't quite six years old, I tried to help him lift a lawnmower out of the back of his Datsun pickup. My job was to hold the front of the mower by the tops of the front wheels. And as I bent down to place the wheels on the driveway, my dad suddenly let go of the back end, causing both the mower and him to crash to the pavement. I immediately thought I had done something wrong. He screamed out in pain 
a neighbor came running from two houses down and we somehow got him inside to his bedroom. When the ambulance came to retrieve him, the paramedics couldn't fit him through his bedroom door on the fracture board, so firemen were called in to remove the bedroom windows. My mom, my brother Josh, and I watched as firemen slid him out the rectangular hole, which used to be the windows, on two fire ladders that served as slide guides. Josh was not quite three years old yet, but observing the scene, he asked my mom, is daddy dead? He wasn't dead at all, but he was the tall and strong one in the family, the one who made sure all the doors were locked in the house at night, and who reached things for my mom on the highest shelves, and sharpened the kitchen knives, and lit the kerosene heater. He was the one who pushed the boat off the trailer to go fishing, and the one who cut and split the logs for the fireplace. Yet it wasn't a chainsaw that felled the, live, the tall live oak of our family, but an old lawnmower and a bad back for which I really didn't understand the cause. In the self-centered world of a five-year-old, I thought that I was the cause and that I had made him hurt bad enough to go to the hospital. I didn't know the back problem started in Vietnam on the same night that they deactivated the last remaining battalion of American combat troops at the tail end of a drip, drip, drip fighting faucet that the country had been slowly and painfully trying to cut off for years. I didn't know about the Mohawk or the night of the crash or the Martin Baker ejection seat or even the presence of a man named Daniel Richards. So I'll stop there and you know we'll we'll take um, and, and this goes on in our concluding quest section but um, that was me as a young guy trying to make sense of what I could tell from context clues had happened to my father, injuries and such, but really didn't know much about because he didn't talk about these things when I was a child. And really, we did not explore this experience in this level of depth until working on this project from 2009 until its publication uh, this year. So um, it's really something that we've explored together in the last decade plus, uh, more so than, than growing up. So. I think we're going to turn it over to Kerry for questions here in a second. Did you have? As you read, you'll see uh, in this book at the top of the page on the right hand side, the left hand side will say 100 days in Vietnam. On the right hand side, it'll be my name. Then when you get toward the back in the quest, you will see the 100 days in Vietnam on the left hand side and Matthew's name on the right. So if he wrote that section or even the introduction, which he did write, uh, his name will be at the top so you'll know who the author is of that part so you won't have to guess. We did that to help the reader understand who voice that was being re recorded as. So that'll give you a little bit of guide, a little bit of help when you're reading the book to kind of straighten that out because you know we both had a hand in this thing and uh, I'm the storyteller and he's, he's, he's the smart one with the writing <laughs> skills. So. Well, we're going to turn it over now. Carrie's going to field any questions that you have. The photo on the screen, by the way, is a 25-year-old Lieutenant Joe Talon in, next to his Mohawk in Vietnam, Marble Mountain Army Airfield. This is, was this before or after a mission? That was coming back from a mission. Yeah, coming back, so right see after that, a mission. See that packet in my right hand that's classified secret or top secret on where I was going? It had gun emplacements and everything that I had to fly over. All of this stuff you know, was in that packet. And the first thing they asked me when I got to the hospital, where's your mission packet? Uh, you pull the ejection handle, you go through 15 G's, which is more than they take to launch you into space. You ain't gonna be holding on to no mission packet or anything else. So I had no clue where that thing was. So that, they wanted to know where the mission packet was. I was like, what? So obviously they had never been ejected. So if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone over. And then we will repeat the question to the audience watching at home. We are in the Weymouth paper today, and it is a misprint. I weighed 170 pounds, not 270, as reported <laughs> in the paper. <laughs> Clerical error added 100 pounds. <laughs> I might weigh that today, but back then, no. Any questions? What, what air base did you fly out of? Uh, Marble Mountain Army Airfield below the name. Yep. It was built by the Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a Marine base. And like most of the forts or bases that we had over there, it was basically built with barbed wire entanglements and minefields and gun towers. There was no, uh, like out west where they had 
these walls and all, you were not inside of a wall fort. I mean, the thing that kept the enemy out was gunfire, and uh, either gunfire or mortars or artillery fire, uh, trying to keep them at bay, keeping them away from our planes. So that's the way we that's the way we lived. We lived always in threat of being attacked, and were quite often. How far north did you fly? The question is. North the how question far is. North? Let me uh, answer it or repeat the question. The question is, how far north did he fly on missions? Okay. Uh, normally. I flew up to the North Cape, which was right below uh, Haiphong Harbor in North Vietnam. But on some occasions, we went all the way up to the Chinese border. And uh, we had the ability with SLAR to look over the border without actually crossing the border. And we could, we could actually see 50 to 70 miles into China and pick up convoys that were headed with supplies to Viet North Vietnam so that we could alert the air boss stuff was coming in on what roads they were coming on before they actually got in country. And once they got in country, then we could attack them. But as long as they were in China, it was hands off, which was a heck of a way to fight a war. You know, we couldn't shoot at them. Yes, ma'am. Who, All right. Normally, on, I had it. Let me let me uh, repeat. On a typical mission, who would be in the aircraft uh, with him as pilot? Yeah. Can you go back to that photo of me and the plane? We'll see if he can switch back to this, because this was my normal observer. He's called a technical observer, and he's operating the spy equipment, which would be either infrared or SLAR on these type missions. And most of my missions were the SLAR missions, not the infrared. I did do some infrared work in Cambodia and Laos and uh, had the opportunity to fly over a plane of jars. That's me right there in the cockpit with the normal observer I would be flying with. And his name was Yarborough. He was a specialist. And he, he, I don't think he ever spoke six words on a mission to me unless something was really really crazy going on. He didn't say one blooming word. The exception happened when we were over North Vietnam and they fired a SAM missile at us. And I decided, being the hotshot pilot that I am and was, the best thing to do was a split S. Well, a split S, if you're flying straight and level, what you do is you roll that wing over and do an inverted turn and, and dive straight down to the ground like you're going hit the ground to increase your airspeed. Because I knew that missile could only turn a two and a half to three G turn, and I was pulling about five Gs when I went by that missile, I turned into the missile. And that missile looks like a telephone pole going by with its tail end on fire, going this way, and I'm going that way. And I look back, and it's tracking on a Navy pilot. It done lost me when that turn, and was tracking on him, but we had other problems. When we got down to the bottom of that turn, I was doing about 450 to 500 miles an hour in a plane that's not designed to go that fast. So I was outside of the flight envelope for the aircraft. So it started porpoising, which means it goes, it wants to fly into the ground, except we were over the ocean. It's trying to fly into the water. And sometimes I came within two or three feet of the water at 400 miles an hour, which is a little unnerving. And I finally, after about six times of the plane doing this, got it back under control. We slowed up enough that I could actually begin a gradual climb back up to altitude. And Yarborough, bless his little heart, we always like to say in the South, that's a Southern expression like y'all, bless his little heart. He says, shit, sir, that was close. <laughs> That's in the book. I never forgot that. I mean, he didn't say a lot, but when he said something, it meant something. And that's what he said after that. That's all he said. He didn't say another word about it. He didn't even report it. But that's what he said to me over the intercom. It made me laugh. Some other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you did flying, when you were flying reconnaissance, were you always just one? Playing yourself. Yes. And you just spoke about a new, 
and my soul was going to right. a Navy person. All right, the Navy would come in. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I flew unarmed and unescorted over North Vietnam. I had a 38 police special in a shoulder holster, which is absolutely useless out of any, against anything they shooting at me, <laughs> including the missiles and the AAA. Uh, AAA is anti-aircraft artillery, which will blow you out of the sky as well as missiles. I am getting chased by MiGs. It would did you no good to have that thing. So uh, we were unarmed and unescorted. Our job, Army aircraft were all named after Indian tribes. So we were supposed to be a scout. We were supposed to sneak in and sneak out and not let them know we were even there, if possible. But they would pick us up on the radar and come after us. So uh, what we would do is holler for help to the air boss. They'd scramble the F-4s off the carriers. In about 30 seconds, they'd be there to rescue us because they would hit the afterburners and when they would come in it. They're coming at about 1,200 miles an hour. It don't take them long to get there. You know, so they're letting it rip, and it doesn't matter if they break the sound barrier because, you know, wasn't anybody on the ground going to complain about that. <laughs> so we were just glad to see them come, but that's what we would have to do is call for help. And uh, we, were, we were never escorted. The only reason that Navy pilot got in the way, he was on another mission to go hit a target. And I just happened to look up through my canopy, you see that all above my head is plexiglass. I happened to look up above me like that behind me and saw the missile going, I want to make sure the missile didn't turn to come after us. That's what I was looking for, for it to make that turn and lock on to us and we'd, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So when I saw it, the Navy pilot was headed for the clouds, the missile turned and went toward the clouds that he was headed for. So I don't know if he made it, or, but the advantage the Navy guys had in their fighters is they had chafe, chaff or chafe they could throw out, out the back they could jettison, and they had uh, flares they could launch out the back of their aircraft, and the missile would hone in one of those flares and explode prematurely before it got close enough to his aircraft to destroy it. So I didn't have any of that. So you had to just outfly them and outwit them in order to come back. Without that, you died. So it, it, it did test your skills. Like he said, it's like teaching school. You can have hours and hours of boredom teaching history. And then when a kid pulls out a razor knife and tries to slit his classmate's throat and you got to disarm him and he's not willing, then you had those moments of terror as a teacher, whether or not you're going to be able to disarm him or he's going to disarm you. So it's the same thing in combat. You got those moments there that, you know, the old heart's pumping. I mean, probably a couple of hundred beats a minute. The highest blood pressure ever recorded and known to man was a Navy pilot landing on a carrier at night in combat with blackout conditions. He landed on a black deck. Now try that sometimes. I tried to land on it in the daytime. I never accomplished it, but I did look at it. So but I said, uh-uh, I'm going somewhere else. I end up in Thailand. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Uh, about how many missions did you fly? About how many so, questions? How many missions did you fly uh, overall? Actually, I didn't fly very many when I first got there, but it picked up the longer I was there, and I end up uh, when I was shot down. I was on my 66th mission, and uh, some days I flew as many as four missions. Because the closer we get to the end of the war, you gotta remember I was a first lieutenant. There was only six of us that were lieutenants and warrant officers in the unit. The rest were captains and uh, they pulled rank. So nobody wanted to be the last man shot down. So the night I flew and got shot down, I wasn't scheduled to fly at all. Somebody backed out, they came got me because they knew I was sober, because I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I was at the old club a lot of nights to watch the movie. And I, I mentioned in the book about watching The Sting in Vietnam. That's when it was coming out that year, if you remember The Sting, with Paul Newman and Robert Redford. If y'all remember that movie, it was a great movie back then. You know, I was in there watching The Sting. That's, that's the reason I would go to the club. Other guys would go to the club to drink or hit on the barmaids and stuff like that. And I would go there to watch a movie and then I'd go back and write a letter to Martha Ann, and those of you who have your book, if you would for me, please, turn to page 80. 
in your book. If you have your book handy, turn to page 80 right now. Ma'am, you got a book in your lap. Would you turn to page 80 right there? Page 80. That's Martha Ann then why I was writing those love letters. So I wanted y'all to see why I was writing those letters. I'll make sure she didn't send me a Dear John. Uh, <laughs> hold on. She's listening. I do have a question. Just one other question. Yes, ma'am. As far as um, the medal, did you try to get for yourself and for the gentleman who lost his life? Right. What was the complication about that, particularly when he, when he died for his country? Well, Here's Hold the, on, wait a second. What was the complication for getting the Purple Heart Medal? You know, why did it take so many years to do so? Okay. All right, here's the situation. We're flying classified missions. We're the Black Hats. And I got a, is it out there, black flying suit somewhere? Yes, dear. Yeah. Did they bring that out? We were original Black Ops. So where we were flying, this is a party suit, or it would have camouflage uh, patches on it. So I never flew that in combat, but I wore it when we went to a party. And uh, that, uh, what we were doing, uh, the president says we weren't there. The army says we weren't there. To this day, they're saying I wasn't there. Daniel wasn't there. They told his family he was killed it was an accident. It was not combat related. He was not in a plane and he was badly burned. The only thing that true about that was he was badly burned. All the rest was lies. And I thought it was awful that they would do that to one person, but they didn't. There were 68 of us that were killed in that plane and over 30 of them got this exact same message to their families. They were actually killed flying combat missions, and that's the message that was sent home to their families. And those people were never recognized. I mean, I didn't fly with them, but those other 29 to 30 uh, pilots and observers never got their proper recognition for their giving their lives for their country. And I thought, as a commission officer, that I took that on as my final mission for the Army, that I was gonna get Daniel's recognition no matter what it took, and I ended up having to sue the Army, sue the Military Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., and five federal judges ordered the Army to present the medals, and they had to do it by one March. I got the medals the 29th of June that year. They still drugged their feet. But they did, and I didn't notice it until my son told me, he said, Dad, they got your name and the date on the back of your medals, like it showed on Daniel's medal earlier. I said, well, they had them long enough. They, <laughs> Could have made them out of gold. <laughs> so, but that's why, because the missions were so classified that the Army still won't recognize the fact that we were there. Yeah, and uh, I also elaborate in the quest section, um, since I'm telling that part of the story, you know, that the Purple Heart Medal is different than some of these other Valor Awards that are recommended. The Purple Heart is, uh, is a determined whether it's earned by, and it, in the determinant is whether your injuries were caused by enemy contact, enemy fire. Uh, so the debate would be whether or not the engine that the engine blew and the plane came down, and the injuries happened. A man was killed, and a man was, another man was seriously injured. So that those facts are indisputable, uh, in dispute at the time. And again, the unit was drawing down and moving off the airfield. Uh, so the the amount to which they wanted to investigate this or pursue it was low. Um, but, you know, the debate is whether or not that engine blew of its own accord after takeoff or whether it was shot down uh, most likely by a Grail surface-to-air uh, shoulder-fired weapon called the S SA-7 Grail, which was in common use by that point by, uh, by the Vietnamese uh, soldiers uh, because they were getting that supplied to them. Uh, so that, that was the debate at the time. Um, and it took witness statements and medical records and things like that to appeal for this Military Court of Appeals action. Uh, but that's one of those gray areas of Vietnam. I mean, no, this is the middle of the night. This happened at 1 a.m. because uh, these are night missions. This happened in the you know, middle of the night. So it's, um, we, have, we have the results of what happened. We don't have any uh, film footage 
or uh, you know to be able to track this down um, you know and, and show anybody a clip but um, yeah that, that's a big part of why it took so long I would not wear the medals until I got orders or got verified that I was entitled to them, whatever they were. And uh, the pictures of me showed in the book and earlier of a uh, Purple Heart ceremony at my university that I graduated from, and I'm wearing nine ribbons from Vietnam. Nine. Well, after that box arrived with my medals and everything, and after Medals of America set up my ribbon rack for me, when I put on my uniform now, it's 29, not nine. The, I was entitled to have. So that gives you some inkling into the fact that we weren't recognized for what we were doing and risking our life on a daily basis. Well, in my case, about every other day. Yeah. So to follow up on that, I actually have a question. How important is it, do you think, for veterans, especially from the Vietnam War, to continue to tell their stories and write books? How important it is, the question is, how important do you think it is for Vietnam veterans to continue to tell their stories uh, and, and possibly write books? Well, the hardest day I've had since coming from Vietnam was the day we presented that Purple Heart to Daniel Richards' cousins in Somerville because I was afraid they would blame me for his death because I blamed myself because I didn't get him out alive. You know, he died. He's the only man I ever lost in combat. In 37 years, four months, and 13 days in the Army, and I started as a private and worked my way through the ranks and retired as a lieutenant colonel. He's the only man I ever lost anywhere in the world. And it still bothers me to this day that I couldn't get him out of that plane alive. And he didn't survive, but he outweighed me by at least 50 to 60 pounds. And I think that was one of the key things why his parachute didn't open. Mine opened at 35 feet above the ground, and I hit the ground at 140 miles an hour, which they said wasn't survivable, but I'm still sitting here, you know, so. I'm going to turn, I'm going to tack that back to her question, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> what do you think about veterans oh. telling their story? How important is it for Vietnam, specifically Vietnam veterans, well, to tell their story? Well, this book has been therapeutic in a way for me and for others in that, just like the Purple Heart Ceremony and going through that and making sure that he got recognized. That was therapeutic for me. Uh, telling the story, the pages were soaked with tears as I was writing it by hand. Uh, that's therapeutic. And uh, getting to meet people like y'all is therapeutic. You know, it, it just makes me feel like what I did was worth it. Uh, that it wasn't in vain that Daniel did not die in vain that day. That his life wasn't wasted. And a lot of people will say, well, we should have never been in Vietnam. We should have never done this, should have never done that. He read an excerpt about that day in Blood Square in Da Nang to you, about them blowing up a bus and killing 29 women and children for no reason except to prove to the government that they could do it. See, and I knew right then we belonged there to stop that. That was my mission. You know, my mission was to make sure those people could live in freedom and feel safe. And wherever they are in the world, I think that's our mission as the United States Army is to try to guarantee that those who can't defend themselves that we will stand up for them. And I think those of you that serve agree with it. You know, it's, it's hard to tell the story and my father wouldn't talk about it until five years before he died. But on D-Day morning, he made six trips up Normandy Beachhead. Never got wounded, didn't get killed, but every man in his boat did. The only injuries he had was burns on his legs from the hot brass that he had to shovel overboard when he'd go back to the ship. His job that day was firing a twin 20 millimeter cannon, giving them air cover going in, and when he got near the shore, he'd fire on the shore batteries to suppress enemy fire on their boat while they picked up wounded and took in medicine to treat the guys on the beaches that were, were dying on the beaches. And he said he went to all six beaches that day. And on some of them, he could have walked on the backs of dead Americans from 200 yards out and never got wet. So when you, when you live through that, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, 
why we have to fight wars, but when we do, we need to fight to win. That's what I say. So, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. You know, I just want to say thank you. I, I think that the, <clears throat> it's not really a question as much as it's a comment about how this has been organized. The <clears throat> putting it into this tapestry format <clears throat> the way it has been, I think, is just remarkable and wonderful. I think it's a very unique approach. And it is. I can't wait to. Uh, I, I no longer can read this, so I look forward to listening to it in the audio right. version. Right. Um, actually, I do have one question. You mentioned earlier that you had taught uh, history. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Was it American history? And what uh, yes, and government and civics and geography. I was in a small school. I was the department for a while. <laughs> you know, whatever they needed taught in the social studies department, European history, I taught that as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if it needed teaching, I, I have, was teaching five classes at one time. Every period was a different subject class. And one of them, I had to teach two in the same class at the same time. One had to be AP and one college prep. So they carry, it, it carried different requirements. Yes. And uh, it made it very difficult to do, but they knew that I would do it. You know, when I was given a mission to do it, I did it. And I had taught 10 years at Fort Bragg at the Intel School. I trained uh, junior and senior officers in the Intel field for 10 years. And somebody said, Colonel, how do you put up with high school students? I said, the Army trained me. And they said, to teach high school students, teenagers? I said, yes. I said, at Fort Bragg for 10 years, I taught the senior officer course. And they are just like teenagers. They know everything. You can't tell them anything. And they expect you to have their papers graded yesterday and back to them. I mean, they act just alike. There's no difference. You just, they're different ages, but they act exactly alike. So I was trained by the Army to teach high school students. What years were you teaching? Ma'am? What, the question is what years? What, what years, years were you teaching in, in the public, classroom? In public schools, I taught from 1981 to 2002. In military schools, I taught from 74 up through 85. And uh, I was doing both jobs at the same time because I had nine years active. They wouldn't let me stay on active duty because of all of my injuries. So I went into reserves and I was teaching at Fort Bragg in the summer and teaching at St. George High School in the fall. So I was actually doing both. So I had 33 years of teaching experience, 37 years in the Army, which is 70 years by my count. And it's a lot of time to be working, but some of it was overlap. So it allowed me to do both jobs at the same time, which I did. And I uh, was glad I did it. I've had some students that went off in the military and have done remarkably well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was in Special Forces, and everybody that gets kicked out of Special Forces can't read a map. And he aced the map test. And his instructors wanted to know how he knew so much about uh, latitude, longitude, how he knew about geographic lines, contour intervals, uh, depressions versus hills and all terrain features and everything on maps. I took military maps into my classroom and taught my school, my students in geography how to read military maps and how to navigate on them and how I gave them map classes like I was teaching the officers in the Army. And uh, I also taught them how to navigate in and out of Charleston Harbor using Lowrance and using uh, radar soundings uh, on how to navigate in and out of a, a, a confined harbor. And uh, so when he got in there, map reading wasn't a problem for him. And they were just amazed at that. And he said, well, I had a colonel uh, teaching me to read maps when I was in high school. And they said, you had a battalion commander teaching you in high school? <laughs> he said, well, he wasn't a battalion commander then, but yes, he was teaching me and he thought that we ought to know how to find our way from one place to the other on a map. And I still believe that. that uh, 
kids should know these things, should know these skills. Yeah. I'm very adamant. <coughs> yes, sir? I didn't end up in question is, how did you end up in the Army versus the other branches, uh, Navy, Marine, Air Force? Yes, I got in the Army the exact same way my father got in the Navy. I was invited by the President of the United States to join the Army. <laughs> when I graduated from college, I got a greetings from President Richard Nixon and says, you're now going to join my company, and it's A42 in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And that's where I ended up. So. I was supposed to be in the Air Force and fly for them. And I had taken all the tests and everything. But the recruiter was saving me for a fall quota so he could meet his recruiting quota. In the meantime, I got drafted. I kept telling him, I said, Army's after me, Army. Don't worry about it. We got you, son. You're going to go fly for the Air Force. Yeah, I got accepted to the Air Force flight program 10 weeks after I was in the Army. So that's how I ended up in the Army as a private in the rear ranks. and. After being in the woods for 10 days in the snow and ice, they flew in some helicopters, picked us up and carried us back where we started 10 days ago in about 20 minutes. They were all nice, warm, clean, hand on clean uniforms. I said, I can do that job. <laughs> I went back to, the, uh, back to my battalion and filled out the paperwork for flight training. <laughs> I said, I can fly. I just know I can fly. <laughs> I didn't want to be infantry anymore. Thank you. So that's how I ended up in the Army. Okay, well, I think that is about it for us on time today. I do want to thank both Matt and Joe for coming in and speaking today. It goes without saying, thank you both very much for your service. Um, and thank you for this book. I think it's very important to hear these stories. I don't think we hear enough of them. Um, so thank you. And I would also like to point out that this is the furthest a speaker has traveled to come speak at our library. So thank you for making the trip up from South Carolina. And thank you all for attending tonight.